Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here with you today to hear uh, David Gotsky share some of his wisdom and insight about creating social change. As Dean of the Business School at UNSW, I'm very proud that we have the Centre for Social Impact as part of us. At the core of our mission is to have impact on individuals, organisations and society more broadly. We produce leaders that, ca that come from and go into all sectors of our community, including the private, public and third sectors. Irrespective of where our graduates end up, they will all have impact and it's part of our responsibility to do what we can to ensure that impact is a positive one. David Gonski is of course well known to most of you, particularly as the Chancellor of this great university. But I'm not going to take the easy option and say he needs no introduction, if for no other reason than hearing about what David has been and is involved in serves to remind us what we should and can aspire to. Of course the two most important things to know about David are that he's not only the Chancellor of UNSW, but he's also a graduate in commerce and law. And this clearly set him up for what has been an extraordinary career. In corporate life, David has or does hold chair or board appointments at ANZ, Coca-Cola Amatil, Investec Bank, Singapore Airlines, Westfield, Fairfax, the Australian Stock Exchange and Singapore Tele Telecommunications, to name a few. In the government sector, David has or is involved as chair or advisor to ASIC, the National eHealth Transition Authority, the Commonwealth Takeovers Panel, the Australian Government Future Fund, Infrastructure New South Wales and the ABC, to name a few. He's also undertaken major policy reviews such as a review of Commonwealth assistance to the film industry and was chair of the expert advisory panel of the Commonwealth Government's review of the funding of schools in Australia. In addition, his support for the arts has been through being Chair of the Australia Council for the Arts, President of the Board of Trustees of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Chair of the National Institute of Dramatic Art, uh, Chair of Film Australia and Chair of the Sydney Theatre Company. He's also served on the boards of St Vincent's Hospital Sydney, the Bundan on Trust, Philanthropy Australia and a range of other third sector entities. He's also patron of the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation. And then there is the personal mentoring that David engages in with individuals across the community. So whether it's creating economic wealth for individuals, companies or nations, supporting the arts, having input into critical public policy issues, or serving organisations that help those with less opportunity than some, David has had and continues to have extraordinary impact. That he was closely involved in founding the Centre for Social Impact is fitting and perhaps no surprise. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps we don't all have the capacity and drive to achieve the same kind of impact as David has, but we're all very glad David does. I'm delighted to introduce the embodiment of social impact, David Gonski. Chris, I too acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land on which this university stands, and I also, if you will allow me, acknowledge the attendance here today of my mother and my sister, who would be horrified if I told you it was her birthday, uh, but I will do just that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no doubt it's horrifying both for my mother and my sister, but it certainly is for me to realise as I stand before you that it is now 42 years since I enrolled at this university as an undergraduate student in commerce and law. I came to enrol from a family who had consciously about 10 years earlier given up the comfortable lifestyle of South Africa to head into the new world of Australia because of concerns about social unrest and social injustice in our place of birth. My late father, who was a brain surgeon, had also inculcated into me, my sister and our brothers, that you didn't just become a person, you didn't just become a businessman in my case, but you had to have a pride in helping people as a brain surgeon is allowed to do almost daily. As, I, as a consequence of this, I chose the University of New South Wales for two reasons. First, it had been the university who had opened its arms to my family when we first arrived here. And even at the age of 18, as I stood enrolling down there on the other side of Anzac Parade, 
I could see how it continued to open its arms to people of different colours, creed and standings in life. The second reason I chose this university was that the law school, which was at that stage a law school steeped in history, it was 12 months old, and had advertised extensively that not only would it teach through the Socratic method, which meant you didn't have to sit through big lectures like this, but it would teach law with an eye to social justice and to improvements in the community. Ladies and gentlemen, the world has changed a lot in 42 years, and I thought in the time that's been given to me here, before you all, I'd like to go through what's happened in the last 40 years, bringing us up to date on a few of the issues close to me that relate to social impact. The first I wanted to talk to you about was philanthropy. In 1972, personal philanthropy in Australia was not well developed. This was abundantly clear by walking through what was one of the most ugly campuses ever built in the world, not just in Australia. As you walk through this campus, and I'd quickly say, of course, it's become beautiful since, <laughs> not once would you really see a building named after a donor, apart from one, and this was the one called Bassa College. And for those of you who know, this was as a result of a gift given by Adolf Bassa in the mid-1950s of 40,000 pounds. There were efforts occurring in 1972, as I sought to become part of this university, to establish Shalom College, but I seem to remember they were having great difficulties getting the money together. But in 1972, when you go back there, for those of you who are interested, you will find that we were governed by a tax act which was really very recent, actually to date it back to just past the end of the Second World War. And the ph philosophy of that tax act, in my opinion, indicated the philosophy of 1972 and beyond. It was a philosophy that you paid your taxes and government will look after you. Government will look after health, welfare, etc. And if they don't quite get to everybody, too bad. Interestingly, this was based more on a British concept than an American one. And a concept which, when you look back on it, allowed a hell of a lot of very wealthy people to be let off the hook because they could say government will do it, they don't need to do anything. In 1972, there were death duties in Australia. And because of those death duties, some in Victoria had been extremely generous. And those of you who are keen on the arts will know about the Felton bequest and bequests like that. These all went to charity, not just because they were very generous, but also because that avoided the death duties of the time. I know exactly when death duties were got rid of, because by that time I was enrolled in another university just down the road, um, doing a degree in death duties, and they decided to annihilate them, which annihilated my degree. <laughs> Back in 1972, the fortunes in Australia were very illiquid. Those who'd made fortunes in real estate hadn't heard of property trusts and property companies, and basically their money was locked in to the properties that allegedly made their fortune. Same was the case with the mining sector. Yes, they did have the Poseidon boom, but most of the moguls just looked at the hills and said there's iron ore there, but there wasn't much being taken out. It's interesting if you look at the background of an illiquid economy, together with tax acts and other legislation which said, leave it to us, the government, and found all sorts of amazing things. For example, if you really wanted to be generous and start a foundation, a charitable foundation like a Rothschilds one or whatever, it was almost impossible to do it. And one of the great criteria of doing it was that you made sure it was run by everybody other than your family, which somewhat defeated the purpose. If you wanted to give a bequest at that time of non-cash items to charities, basically it was taxable. 
The good news was in 1972 there was no capital gains tax, but that was fixed in 1985 and the Act hadn't been changed. So if you gave a gift of non-cash to a charity, you had the great fortune of paying tax in the way through. You couldn't basically donate as a salary earner because if you did, you'd get a tax deduction 18 months down the track, which probably is well after you'd forgotten giving the donation. And finally, and many of you will remember, because it still goes on today, but quite wrongly, you had to actually give your donations in the year in which you had your income, because you couldn't carry it forward into the year subsequently and get a tax deduction. That's the history, by the way, of why charities all ring you in June, thinking you've forgotten the law has changed and thinking you'll give them something at that point. This was basically what was happening as I stood there trying to enrol as a student at this university. There was no special associations or entities for not-for-profits. There was no CSI, and indeed, there was very little talked about actually in the social side. No special courses, etc. Over the last 42 years, a lot has happened. The rich in Australia have become part of the world of rich people. They've been able to turn their wealth into something that's much more liquid. We've also noted over the years that the haves and the have-nots have got even further apart. And what we've come to now is a realisation that philanthropy is not something that you should ignore. It is not something that you shouldn't try and make people get involved in and enjoy. And it is not something that an act like the 1948 Tax Act can be allowed to say, leave it to government. Why is philanthropy today so important? Well, I'd like to put to you two reasons. First, it can assist in breaking down the barriers between the rich and the poor. If the haves have a lot and the haves have nots have very little, what could be better than those who have showing that they understand that? And not in a condescending way, but in a way of generosity, standing up and trying to bridge the gap. The second thing is, governments, in my opinion, are like aircraft carriers. They are lumpy and very big. How can a government really deal with a specific social problem? They can deal with a social problem throughout Australia, and they do it usually like an aircraft carrier with lots of waves and a lot of water moving around. The philanthropist, on the other hand, can be like a frigate. They can move to the bay where the problem is, sort it out and move it to some prominence that might be able to be dealt with by the aircraft carrier or alternatively fix it up. Since my time of standing there in 1972, the 1948 Tax Act, believe it or not, has actually been changed. Not repealed, but changed. And today, the wealthy can start their own charitable foundations. And since 2002, when the law was changed, which seems amazing, it took 30 years since I enrolled at this university. What were we doing? But anyway, since that time, more than a thousand individuals have set up private financial uh, situations to give to charity. And I'm pleased to tell you that as of today, more than $3 billion are sitting in those funds with a requirement under statute to give 150 million, i.e. 5% per annum, to charities. Donations of non-cash items are now tax-free. And indeed, not-for-profits shouldn't really be calling you in June because you can carry it forward for as long as you like. They've even started a thing called the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. That's the good news. It's there and it's basically going to look after all the not-for-profits, etc. The bad news, as many of you would know, is that it's going to be repealed. Um, unfortunately for that organisation, it is in a wonderful position of being the subject of a repeal which hasn't quite got through the Senate yet. Why we need to repeal it, I don't know. But on the other hand, the concept that it was there is a recognition 
of the coming of age of not-for-profits and their need to have special attention. There's still no special association or entity for the not-for-profit industry. Many of you who are involved will know that you use a company limited by guarantee. Well, a company limited by guarantee goes back to the 14th century. It was pretty useless then, and it's even more useless now. The fact is we need a special association, and it's quite interesting that New Zealand has one, but somehow we can't. One of the most significant changes of recent time is the con concept of workplace giving. Now you can get your tax deduction straight away as a salary earner when you do give to charity. And I must say, having recently gone to the prizes for workplace giving, it's wonderful to see how companies and individuals are getting involved in that. So encouragement is beginning in philanthropy, but have we become generous? In my opinion, and many of you may disagree, Australians are generous people. Look at what they do with their time. Look at the lifesavers on our beaches and look at the Olympic volunteers in the year 2000. But we're not great money givers. And when you analyse the money giving, particularly with the assistance of the Petrie Foundation, who have sponsored a lot of this work, you find out that actually those who are not that wealthy are very big givers in Australia on a world situation. It's the very rich that as a percentage of their capital and wealth give significantly less than their counterparts in America, but they're keeping pact with those in the UK. But I'd hate to say most in the UK don't have much money these days anyway. Recent announcement, I'm pleased to say to you, like the Packer family giving 200 million to a foundation for arts and sport, the late Paul Ramsey sadly dying but gifting his entire $3.5 billion estate to a foundation to do good things, and the announcement here in this room by Frank Lowy that he'd given in the last 10 years $350 million and in, in, intended to continue. These are all wonderful things. But the most significant thing, in my opinion, is the fact that our education system is beginning to think about these things. The Centre for Social Impact, I think, is one of the great parts of that. And I really hope, and I'm only the Chancellor, so there's not a lot I can do, that it will permeate through courses generally here. It is interesting to me that to be a good person it is very important to be a broad person. And as I say to all the graduates as I speak to them, it doesn't mean you don't specialise, but it means that you're aware much more of what's going on around you than the specifics of what you're actually dealing with. And I think that the concept of understanding social problems, contributing and getting involved, is absolutely essential, and philanthropy is a mechanism for doing that. Let me just give you a few more points on philanthropy. Firstly, I mentioned earlier Adolf Basser. Regularly in discussions with donors, I asked particularly our alumni whether they know the name Basser. Everybody gets awfully excited and says, yes, Basser College. My next question is, who was Adolf Basser? And if there is anybody sitting in this room who knows, you are one person better than the normal. No one knows of the man who was one of the richest people in Australia in the early 1950s. No one knows of his activities as an optician and jeweller. No one knows that he owned two horses that won the Melbourne Cup in separate years. No one knows that he sold his business to Angus and Coote, the jewellers. Some know that he donated money to other institutions, which proves my point. But everybody knows, especially our alumni, the good work that his money, all the way back in 1950s, has done to Bassa College. What I'm basically saying to you is that philanthropy can not only do good, but it can do good for one's own reputation and one's own thinking. As I sat there last night thinking of what I'd say to you, two names came into my head, Getty and Carnegie. As, a, uh, as somebody who studied economic history, and our dean might also know this, they were two of the worst scoundrels you could meet. But when you go to the Getty, or for that matter the Carnegie Hall, 
you certainly get a better view of them so many years later. This brings me to the question which so many ask me, is it in the Australian psyche to give philanthropically and to put one's names all over the place? My firm view is that one of the marvellous things about philanthropy is that it is personal. And therefore it is up to people whether they wish to name things, whether they wish to give, and whether they wish to give lots or little. But the most important thing to me is that there are two parts to philanthropy. One is giving the money to do good things. The second thing is demonstrating that you are a person who perhaps should be followed to do that. I always push people to put their name to their donations, and I always find that's often harder than pushing them to make the donation at all. People like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have set incredible examples to all of us of what can be done in philanthropy. But the interesting thing is that everybody, no matter what one's wealth, is capable of doing it either in time or money. Gates, by the way, told us when he was here that he believes that the best way to get the rich in Australia giving is to reintroduce death duties, which would be great for me because I could go back and finish my degree <laughs> at Sydney University. Um, I don't agree. To me, that is saying I have a sore throat, so I will shoot myself. Uh, that has somewhat drastic consequences. Having said that, I do believe that all of us, through education, through talking, need to make people understand that extremes are dangerous and that the best way to deal with extremes is basically to find a middle ground and that philanthropy for those who are rich and indeed for those who are not so rich but have something is a way of doing that. Let me move to corporate social responsibility. Let me take you back when I arrived at the law school in 1972. The general law was that directors of companies had an absolute obligation to, the, to their shareholders. As a consequence, most companies in 1972 were operated for profit and the maximization thereof. If a company could reduce its tax legally, it was expected to do so. Staff in those days generally stayed for almost all their career with the one company. The company was assumed to look after the staff, but didn't have to do that that well. A lot of what big business did was actually revered. And you won't believe it, and I speak as the chairman of a big bank, if you were the chair of a big bank, you were quite important. The essence of what the new law school, as it then was, came to do was to start to question that. To question whether the duty of a lawyer and indeed the directors of companies generally was not broader. I still believe, but remember the first dean of the law school, Hal Wooden QC, who I'm pleased to report is still alive and well. He was the embodiment of a person who could make a fortune from helping rich companies do whatever they wanted to do. But he chose to use his enormous skills to fight for those less privileged in the community and kept questioning the gap that was developing between those who have and those who have not how prescient he was and those who established the law school were. As a practitioner of law throughout the 80s, I, wa I worried and watched an incredible period of greed. We saw a slavish love of profits and excess. We saw wholesale exploitation of many groups within the community and indeed Australia's resources generally. Throughout this, I confess I felt uneasy whether it was what I'd learnt at the University of New South Wales or whether I was just wise enough to see the pendulum swinging too far in the wrong way. Because of a belief that the repercussions would be enormous, I and a lot of business, not just me, hoped that we could bring ourselves back to the middle ground. Commentators in those days began questioning whether the responsibility of directors really was just to make a profit and to assist shareholders, or was it really to build a strong and viable company for the long term? The latter involving this new concept, which by the way wasn't here in 1972, of sustainability. 
Through the 90s, this concept of sustainability became part of the norm. And now in the 2000s and beyond, it's become wired into most of the large companies and indeed corporate life generally. There is a realization as follows. First, the younger members of staff, and many of you are younger, are looking for more than just making money. They are not as slavishly loyal to one company and are looking, and if I may say so in my opinion correctly, to be proud of what they're doing, and this involves being proud of the organization in which they work. Second, we're seeing more power in the hands of consumers, whether it be through the internet, wide television offerings or whatever. The consumer is much more knowledgeable now than 42 years ago and much more likely to question and have the ability to do so whether they wish to take the services of particular corporations if they're not doing something good in the community. I, as an example, I chair a company that's called SPC Ardmona. We were basically losing greatly because people chose to buy their tomatoes from Italy, Spain, and dare I say it, South Africa. One day, a young woman in Wollongong started a thing called SBC Sunday. She did it without our help and on her own. After one million people got involved in SBC Sunday, I'm pleased to report to you, SBC Ardman is doing very well. Thank you very much. But basically, it was the power of the consumer, a woman, her friends, and the concept of the internet deciding we've got to do something. We need to make our own product here and not just bring it in. The law has indeed also recognized that things are changing. They've realized that directors are entitled and indeed must look much more broadly than just their shareholders. So what are the manifestations of all of this? First, most big companies provide their shareholders on a regular basis with a sustainability report. Second, most large companies have CSR projects in which they involve their staff and all around them. Third, the recent Australian Institute of Company Director numbers show that the vast majority of company directors are also on boards of not-for-profits, giving their time to good causes for no consideration and more importantly, seeing what's happening on the other side of the street. Most larger companies have embodied a workplace giving program to which I referred earlier, and some companies have established foundations to allow the giving. In my opinion, this is all evidence of a change in social thinking, that companies are part of their society, and if they ignore their society, they do that at their peril. This extension has come with some very interesting problems. How far does the obligation of a company go in its society to do good? Many of you may have had the problem, I certainly have, where people come to you and say, you can invest as an investor in cigarette manufacturing, should you do it? It's good for your superannuation people if you're in that sort of business, but on the other hand, look at the tragic effects of cigarettes and look at the tragic cost on our economy. Interesting, where does one draw the line? When I was chairman of the Future Fund of Australia, we chose to withdraw from investing in cigarette manufacture, but then everybody started to ask us about getting out of coking coal, getting out of sugar, which as chairman of Coca-Cola might have been a bit of a problem, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Somewhere there has to be a line, but the interesting question is, or the interesting statement, is that people are now starting to question, and I believe with moderation, one can certainly find the right place. Can a listed company give away money as philanthropy? I strongly believe that listed companies still have to use their money wisely for the benefit of their companies. And to just give away money, in my opinion, is not something a corporation can do. It is interesting to me as chairman of the ANZ that we spend a lot of our money helping people to understand financial literacy. And I think that's perfectly logical. We're a bank, we should be proud of what we do, and we should put money into that. 
whether if we were, for example, to be supporting something in Siberia, where we have no operations, one would have to question, no matter how good that support may be, what relevance it has to a corporation. Can a corporation give anonymously, as some do? In my opinion, anonymous giving by corporations has shades of the underworld. Why don't they want to tell us that they're giving it? And I believe that we should sing loudly what we do, and therefore, in my opinion, anonymous donations are a bad thing. The standing of business in the community is very fickle and able to be influenced very quickly by social media and other newer devices. Aloofness by a business, as was the case in 1972, doesn't work anymore. That's good, but it also puts on the whole community, in my opinion, a responsibility not to demand ridiculous things, but to work together to bring about good things for as many people as we can. I do wonder, as I get older, how remote some of the top CEOs and directors can become from what is going on in society. And I include, by the way, the chairman of the company, namely myself. The involvement of CEOs generally in not-for-profits, doing their work in that way, is a wonderful way of them getting involved. And I must say, I find it quite amusing when one, one is criticised for doing things in the community because you should be spending all your time on your company. I implore all of you to be as broad as possible and stand up and say, I'll do my job, but at the same time, I want to help people and look around more generously. I have not dealt with government relations, and one of the sadnesses, in my opinion, of the last 42 years is how governments, both left and right wing, have found it more and more politically feasible to lampoon business rather than embrace it. And I think that that's sad both for government, for the people of Australia, and also for business. I strongly believe that in a well-balanced career, people should move from for-profit to not-for-profit, from government to business. And we should all appreciate what each other are doing, working together for a communal and proper purpose, rather than blaming each other for what's happening. Finally, I believe a product of my choice to go to the law school at this university has been my joy in being involved in the community more generally. I love the fact that our law school has the Kingsford Legal Service within it and so many outreach programs. I love the fact that our business school has the Centre for Social Impact. And if I am accused of being slightly pink or not a true business person, so be it. Because I believe I'm enunciating what the modern business person actually is and should be. And if I may say so, what the modern person should be. Someone who doesn't criticise the various elements of life, but is aware that all have to work together. As I finish up to allow some questions, I just wanted to say something about fundraising, because people often say to me, um, what is happening with fundraising? You've talked about philanthropy, you've talked about companies. I've looked up the amount that this university received in 1972. Um, let me put it this way, it wasn't worth looking up. <laughs> Today, the raising of, by the university is still by US standards small, but it's much bigger than 42 years ago. The essence of what's occurred over the period is not just that philanthropy has increased, nor that business has realized the importance of being involved. The fact is that fundraising for communal and not-for-profit exercises has become more professional. When Warren Buffett agreed to give his enormous fortune to the Gates Foundation, the reason he gave was that he saw himself as a very good investor, but, that so but he was somebody who was ignorant on how to give money within the society that he lived. This was an amazing realization for me and most who heard this great man's words, what he was saying was in fact very clear, that it takes training to work out how to give money just as it does how to make money and to run organisations. So many people in life know how to make money and indeed accumulate it. So few know how actually to give it and to give it in a way 
that makes a difference. I believe that over the last 42 years, the donors have become more sophisticated in their expectations, and the fundraisers for charity have improved. What is very clear is that fundraising has become extremely important, but what is even more clear is that it's not just a matter of ringing in June or putting a hat around to raise monies, but one actually has to sell a product, a dream, a concept, and do it well. I might say that the not-for-profits seeking donations have also improved their offerings, but they only improve their offerings if they make sure that they give all sizes, rather than suggesting that all sizes fit all. I learned very early in my not-for-profit fundraising career that it is not hard to ask people to give money. And it is not hard if you take the view that you're offering them an opportunity. If they say no, that's their choice. If they say yes, aren't they clever? The use of new technologies such as crowdfunding, social media generally, are exciting ways in which not-for-profits can extend their wings within our communities. But fundamentally, the good fundraiser knows that it's a long-term relationship. Almost invariably, the big donor has given before, and almost invariably, smaller gifts lead to bigger ones. Good fundraisers, in my opinion, can bring both good returns for organisations in which they work, and also almost be the, the, the wonderful soothsayers of a, uh, a just community in offering those, like myself, who chose business to be able to do something outside of their own circle. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, 42 years is a long time. It is therefore not surprising that a lot has changed in both philanthropy, corporate social involvement, and the fundraising community. I would put it to you that in general terms, it's a good news story in Australia. The tide has come a long way since 1972. I'm particularly proud that this university has been involved in that tide. And it's my hope that centres, such as the Centre for Social Impact, and that the concept of being involved in one's community is inherent in all that we do at this university. Indeed, I dream that maybe somebody enrolling today, it'll be for second semester, will in 42 years be asked to stand up here and assuming they can still stand up, remember the joy of being involved in their society and seeing a truly, in my view, socially aware and cohesive nation.